So we're now recording. So hello, welcome to the UNCG Libraries Research and Application Webinar Series. Sam Harlow, the online learning librarian for UNCG Libraries. Uh, in this series, different librarians will cover topics on UNCG Libraries resources and research tools. They are 30 minute webinars and recorded in WebEx meetings where we are now and placed on the library webpage through YouTube where that's where they're also closed captioned and participant data is redacted for privacies. Um, the the um, website is uncg.libguides.com slash webinars. Uh, that's also where you can sign up for future links. And it also is where uh, the presentation materials will live if uh, slides are a part of this as well. So today we have um, a presentation on policy map, which you can see on the screen. It is being hosted by UNCG Libraries, GIS, and Data Viz librarian, Joe Klein. So Joe, you can get going. Thank you, Sam. Um, so as Sam said, I am Joe Klein, GIS and Data Visualization Librarian at UNCG University Libraries. Um, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm going to show you policy map. So today, um, I'm going to go through the content and data sources for data that you can find on policy map. Um, in addition to, you know, what is policy map? Um, I'm going to also go over some features on policy map, which includes maps, tables, and reports, um, and how you can use those. I'm going to demo how you can use those to explore um, some data. So policy map is a GIS light database that can be used to explore data um, from a variety of sources and topics through maps, tables, and reports. Um, GIS light, um, I use here to refer to tools that are often web-based. Um, that are designed to allow folks to map and visualize data without extensive GIS training or programming experience. So you don't have to know how to code. You don't have to know how to use um, a GIS uh, a software program. Um, you can just go online and use policy map um, and slap your data up on the map and explore it. Um, so unlike the full GIS, tools like policy map focus on visualization or reporting of data rather than statistics and analysis. So you won't be able to use policy map to do a lot of statistical analysis of this data, but it's a great tool for exploring it, um, for comparing it visually on the map or through tables. Um, and it's really good for finding data that you can then download and uh, upload into another statistics program if you needed to. Um, but I use it mostly to explore and look at the pretty maps. <laughs> Um, so content and data sources. So what kind of data sets can you find in policy map? Where does policy map get this data? Um, and what does that data look like? So there are 37 K 37,000 data indicators on policy map, um, which is kind of just the data points or data sets. Um, they're organized in points, um, which are specific points on the map um, or in layers, which are uh, different kind of shapes that are overlaid onto a map. Um, which I will show you in policy map itself in a little bit. So there's over 37,000 of these. So there's so much data available um, for you to look at and explore. Um, it's in content uh, topics such as demographics, incomes and spending, housing, lending, quality of life, economy, education, health and federal guidelines. So um, these are the nine main categories of data. Um, things like demographics are um, reported by the US Census Bureau and other US government agencies or institutions. Um, things like quality of life could include, um, so homes with or without internet access, um, libraries, businesses, um, you know, where the farmers markets are or grocery stores are around in your neighborhoods or around uh, the map um, and things like that. So where does policy map get this data? So it gets this from over 45 public and 20 proprietary sources. Um, so this includes US government agencies, bureaus and other entities. So like the US Census Bureau, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Environmental Protection Agency, the CDC, Fish and Wildlife Service, Department of Transportation and on and on. So um, a lot of the data sets come from those US government agencies which form the bulk of the 150 data sources that uh, policy map has. Um, they also get their data from universities and college, such as Harvard or the University of Maryland, uh, which have various research groups that do collect and report data. Um, they get retail location information from Nielsen, um, and Nielsen, I think it's Lynx TD or TD Lynx. Um, and they also, um, one thing that's interesting is get their data from Zillow. So Zillow um, provides a lot of housing data and things like uh, um, housing costs, who's buying 
uh, what types of houses in what neighborhoods um, and that sort of data. So they have a partnership with Policy Map to have to give you guys access to that. Um, so we get a lot of this data through a subscription to Policy Map, but there is also a publicly available um, version of it where you can get um, a good majority of this data as well. But I think things like Zillow um, and some of the nonprofit data is limited to um, subscription service. So we have a subscription through UNCG. Um, university libraries. So features, how can we explore all of this data? So we have over 37k um, things to look at. How do we explore these and look at them? And how do we view and export them for our projects or for your research? Um, first, you have to link that data to a place. Um, so one of the primary ways that policy map organizes its data is geographically on a map. Um, so all of this data is linked to place, it's linked to states, it's linked to counties, um, smaller geographies, which I'll go into. Um, and all of these different sources report their data um, in different ways. So you have things like the Census Bureau, which reports, you know, population, um, so the population density for a county. Um, and then you have other things like Zillow, which kind of looks at a neighborhood level or maybe a state level. Um, so all of this data has to be standardized across different sources so that you can compare it. Um, it's kind of hard to compare apples and oranges. So counties and states um, are going to have different uh, numbers of people, different uh, uh, racial and economic, socioeconomic builds. Um, so all of these have to be standardized across places. So one of the ways um, that this is done is through geographies. Or I guess the way it's done is through geographies. So um, the US Census Bureau um, is one of the, uh, I guess, primary uh, institutions that determine geographies um, that we collect data for. Um, but there are other things. So there's different levels of data. Um, starting at the top is nation, and then it goes um, to the smaller geographies, including regions, divisions, states, counties, and then into the US Census Bureau um, geographies, which are census tracts, block groups, and census blocks. Um, the two that policy map, the smallest that policy map will go to is block groups. Um, and the two blue circled here, um, census tracts and block groups, are the two most likely um, uh, the smallest geographies that you'll see for a lot of the data on policy map. And this is because if you go much smaller, um, data becomes identifiable. So if you go much smaller to census blocks or specific neighborhoods, um, it is easier for somebody looking at this data to tell who specifically is this data about. Um, so a lot of it is limited to block groups, which could include, I think it's somewhere from 100 um, to 500 residences or households um, and things like that. So these geographies or places are determined by different entities. So the US Census Bureau does determine census tracts, block groups, and census blocks. Nations determine zip code tabulation areas, um, urban areas, and metropolitan areas. Um, states determine school districts, congressional districts, urban growth areas, and a bunch of other different type of places. Um, and counties do voting districts, traffic analysis zones, and other subdivisions for within those counties. Um, one of the reasons that policy map uses Census Bureau data is the census, um, when it reports its, its census data or the American Community Survey data, it tries to make it as uniform as possible so that you can compare across these groups um, without having to pay too much attention to things like population density or um, socioeconomic status of the, the groups that are represented inside those geographies. Um, so census uh, Tracks and block groups are going to be a little bit more uniform in terms of how many people are represented in those areas versus things like zip codes um, or traffic analysis zones. So zip codes are used primarily for mail delivery. So the USPS will deliver mail um, based on zip code. That's how they help sort things. Um, so zip codes are going to focus a lot more on things like um, distance traveled. So how long does it take to get from point A to point B um, within the zip code? Uh, for mail delivery purposes. Uh, so they're not as uniform in terms of population. And here's another example of this kind of in a less of a diagram format, more on the map. Um, so here's those Census Bureau geographies, which are a little bit more uniform, um, starting with regions, divisions, and states. Um, within states, you have counties, um, and all of the Census Bureau geographies are nested. Um, so they are 
uh, smaller features fit within those larger features and their boundaries don't overlap. So a county will be within a state, a county subdivision will be within that county, tracks inside the, the county and so on. Um, whereas things like zip codes can overlap with state borders, you can have um, one zip code can encompass three different counties or you can have three different zip codes within one county. Um, they overlap and they're kind of hard to compare um, between. Um, whereas census bureau geographies are really easy to compare between um, those different uh, place, the different geographic levels. Um, here's another example of that just to help um, visualize it a little bit better. So you have your state within the nation, so California within the US, you've got a county within that state, a tract within that county, block group within that tract, and so on um, and so forth until you get down to the block group level. Um, there's more Census Bureau geographies that are less regular, um, and these aren't always nested. So this is things like urban areas, metro areas, congressional districts, um, and places. And zip codes would also be included in this, but they aren't set by the Census Bureau, so they're not on this image. Um, and these can be used to compare, so you can compare urban areas such as Baltimore versus New York City. Um, but with these, you have to keep in mind the population density, um, which might skew the data um, or make it mean different things. So now moving on to the features, and I'm going to go ahead and demo some of these or most of these features as well, as well as some stuff that you can do using one of my favorite examples. Um, so policy map has four main uh, features, including maps, tables, reports, and then three layer maps, which is kind of a newer um, feature that is still being explored. So the big three are maps, tables, and reports. So I'm going to go ahead and we can get to policy map um, through the UNCG Greensboro Library. So since we have our subscription to it, this is going to be underneath the databases. P for policy map. And then if you scroll down, it'll take you to the specific policy map link. Or you can use the link, which is just uncg.policymap.com. Um, and that'll log you in, I guess, or, or give you access to the policy map website through the UNC Greensboro subscription. Um, you can also create your own account within this subscription, which will let you um, do more things like add your own data so you can upload data that you have to compare it with the data that's already in here um, and do a lot of other cool features. But I'm mostly going to focus on what we can do without an account um, for the sake of this presentation. So right off the bat, it starts you off in the map section. So you can zoom in on the map. Um, you can change the base, the, the base map or the, the kind of map in the background. You can change it to satellite here. Um, and it does this cool thing where you can see both at the same time. Um, or you can just see the street view. I prefer street view. And here's all of these tabs with those nine main categories of data. So um, the demographics data is largely from the US Census Bureau. We have data layers, which include things like population density. Um, and if you click on a data layer, it will pop it up in their standard purple color. So um, in the data layer legend, it'll show you what data set you're looking at, what source it came from. And if you click on it, it'll give you more information. Um, so it'll pull up in a new link, um, more information about that data set. So right now we're just looking at population density uh, from the US Census. It'll tell you the year that you could select. Um, so one thing to note is, um, each year that the data is reported sometimes has its own um, geography. So the US Census Bureau has 2010 geographies and it also has more um, up-to-date geographies. So in 2020, when we do another um, US Census, a decennial census, they will report new geographies for anything that has changed. So any block groups um, or counties or things that have changed, um, they'll, they'll update those as well. Um, but policy map will kind of standardize all of this data using the 2010 geographies. So if you're looking at historic data, um, I think the census population density as far back will go down to 2008 is the furthest back it'll go, but it'll report it using the 2010 geography. So it's easier to compare it with other more recent data. Um, it'll show you the variables. So right now it's just the rate, um, just the percentage population density within these things. Um, and it'll give you a shaded by option. So as you zoom in right now, this is on zip code. Um, so the shaded areas are zip codes. If you zoom in on the map, it'll change depending on how close you are. 
And you can also select it too. So if I zoom in far enough on say Greensboro, so it has changed to census tract um, and policy map, it, it's designed to favor those census um, things. So it, it'll start with zip code and then it'll go down to census tracts. And if block groups are available, it will also show those as well. Um, sometimes they're grayed out, but it just means you have to keep zooming in. Um, so now block group is available and it's showing based on block group. One interesting thing too is if you see universities, um, a lot of times the, the data isn't available for that region or since it's a university, it is a different kind of entity. So there is no block group for the University of North Carolina, whereas for the residential areas around, um, there is data available. Um, so different data sets will have different availability and different quirks um, similar to that. So once you're in that uh, uh, view, it'll show you uh, legend and I keep trying to click on it and highlight it, but it's just dragging it so you can click and drag it. Um, one thing that's interesting to note um, for other data sets is the ranges are kind of predetermined. So you can select however many you want if you want seven. Um, only three to make it simple. Um, you can also determine these numbers. So if you don't, uh, so one thing to know is, is this is a huge range. So zero to 1,000, 1,000 to 4,000, 4,000 to 600 and 3,000. Um, that's a really big difference. So it's kind of hard to compare um, or you know definitively say that this dark purple region, like this dark purple could be anywhere from 4,000 to 600 and 3,000. Um, so sometimes it's cool, it's, it's nice to go through and uh, change those numbers so that it's looking at what you want to look at. So if you want to compare it to just 6,000, so it will, I think if it maxes out, it'll still be purple. Um, so then it only shows things that are 6,000 or less. Um, so that's population density. Um, there are other things. So you have uh, data points. Um, one of my favorite data points is libraries. Um, so it'll pull up, get rid of the population density layer so that it's a little bit easier to see. Um, it'll pull up libraries um, according to the IMLS, so the Institution of Museum um, and Library Services. Um, so they do a public, public library survey um, the most recent one available is 2016. Um, and that's the thing to remember is um, policy map will update the data as the source updates it. So when they put out another survey, um, policy map will grab that and pull it in for you. So you don't have to worry about updating all that data. Um, so the Greensboro Public Library is this one right here. Um, Lifelong Learning Center. It only shows public libraries. It won't show like university libraries. So UNCG's library, unfortunately, won't be on here. Um, but it is interesting. And you can also filter these points. So um, for data sets that have um, different types of data in there, so we could select just bookmobiles, we could do just central libraries, or we could color code them. So this is one of those central libraries. And then these other gray colors are going to be branch libraries. Um, there's also, let's see if there's any green bookmobiles. As you zoom out, the icons will stay the same size. So sometimes it's easier to see things. So we have a bookmobile up here in Winston-Salem. Um, and it's it's cool for exploring that sort of thing. So if you want to see where the bookmobiles are home, here's one kind of in the middle of everything in Danbury. So I'm going to get rid of that filter and just show all the libraries. Um, you can also filter things like jurisdiction, whether it's a city or county library. Um, Native American Tribal Government Library, a school district. Um, you can do average weekly hours. So if you want to do, if you want to explore um, libraries that are open for, let's say, nine or fewer hours per week, um, there's much less of these. One of them is going to be this library down in High Point, which is a bookmobile. So mostly bookmobiles are going to be less. So I'm actually going to change that filter to just 35 to 59 hours. Even less. Um, yeah, so you can do cool things like filtering um, those data sets. You can also look at things. So quality of life is another cool one to go to. 
Um, one of my favorite data layers is internet access. So you can look at households that reported that they didn't have high speed internet access or any type of internet access at all. Um, and it will show those. So you could use those to compare um, public libraries in these areas versus percentage of households with no internet access. Um, so if I zoom in enough, find a library, here's the Greensboro Public Library on Church Street, and it's looking at census tracts. So for this census tract and for this city even, um, let's see which regions. So 12.31 to 22.97% of households in this area don't have um, internet access at all. So, and there's where it, it, it's interesting that dark purple doesn't necessarily mean a lot. It could mean just 22% um, versus, you know, 75% of households in this region don't have um, uh, internet access. So I'm actually going to make this a little bit bigger. Okay, so we don't have any places within Greensboro, uh, many households that are 75% or more um, households within a census tract that don't have internet access, but we do have a bunch that are between 20 and 74 and it looks like it didn't save. 50. There we go. So we have a couple that are 50% um, of households within those census tracts. So over here and over here, um, it's kind of hard to tell with the orange um, library uh, points where those are, but you'll see for this area where 50 to 74% of households don't have internet access, the nearest library is a decent um, distance away, especially for folks who don't have vehicles or who depend on walking um, or public transit. Um, for places like this, where it's 50 to 74 percent of households don't have internet access, they might be getting their internet access from this one branch library that's within walking distance of their residences. Um, so this is where it also might be cool to uh, look at the city as a whole. You could zoom out and compare different cities. Um, so Greensboro overall, I believe that is 19% to 25% of folks don't have um, internet access, but there's uh, quite a few libraries, maybe not as close as we would like, um, but at least a couple public libraries. Um, so it's uh, hard to get specific numbers uh, from this map. It's cool to compare and see visually, but when you want to look at numbers specifically, it might be more helpful to go to tables. So tables and the reports features, all the features will pull in data from the data that you have loaded already. So I have the no internet access and libraries loaded um, and tables will pull in for locations. So if I wanna search Guilford County, North Carolina, and if I wanna compare it with Orange County, North Carolina, a lot more folks in Guilford County don't have access to internet access or a lot more um, uh, uh, Area, places in the counties have uh, less internet access or they're at those households. I'm trying to figure out how to say the percentage of households with no internet access. There's more of them in Guilford County um, than in Orange County. And that's a percentage, so it doesn't really matter how many folks are there um, population density wise, um, just straight percentage. Um, it's a lot easier to compare across uh, uh, places with different um, population densities. And you can also see that we have 10 libraries, 10 public libraries versus four um, for Guilford County. Um, this one's a little bit harder to compare. Guilford County might be bigger than Orange County. Um, it might have more support for public libraries or it could just be bigger um, and therefore have more. So that's a little bit harder to compare. Um, there's definitely more need for it if folks are getting their internet access from public libraries, for example. Um, you could also do like a city level. So I could search Greensboro, North Carolina, and I could compare that with other things within Guilford County. So say we wanna compare Jamestown. Um, and then let's also do High Point. Oops. So, and I'm gonna get rid of Orange County to make it a little bit easier. So Greensboro, North Carolina has a higher percentage of households with no internet access compared to Guilford County as a whole. Um, Jamestown um, has less percentage of households with no internet access, so more folks have internet 
excess in that um, area. So that's kind of helping average out the Guilford County. Um, so places like Greensboro or High Point, you might see more libraries or public libraries with internet access than Jamestown. Um, and we do kind of see that reflected um, where Jamestown has zero. It also is a lot smaller compared to Greensboro, um, whereas like Greensboro is eight. So if you are unsure whether, you know, say, I'm not sure whether Greensboro is bigger than Jamestown, so I can't really tell whether eight is a lot compared to zero um, for that area. One of the ways that you can see that, so you can generate reports um, for a specific location. So if I want to do a predefined location, a radius, or a custom region, so say I just want to do Jamestown, North Carolina. So it'll show you on the map so you can get a feel for where you're um, um, make sure that's actually what you're looking at. Um, and it's also interesting, you can see that Jamestown has a bunch of tinier areas. I think you can also add other cities. So if I wanted to add Greensboro, it might not do two at once. I think it does one at a time. So if I wanna do Greensboro, you click generate report and it'll tell you everything about this um, location. So it'll tell you what school districts, congressional districts it's in. It'll tell you the populations. Um, so in 2010, in Guilford County, there's 488,000 people. In Greensboro specifically, there were 269. Um, so more than half lived in Greensboro. Or more than half of the people that lived in Guilford County live in Greensboro. Um, it'll take you, tell you racial characteristics, age distribution, and a bunch of other demographic and socioeconomic um, factors that might um, be interesting to look at and compare between the two. So let me also look up Jamestown just to get a feel for how many people are in Jamestown in 2010. So Jamestown in 2010 had 3,382. So it kind of makes a little bit more sense that maybe they had zero public libraries within the Jamestown city proper um, versus Greensboro, which has so many more people um, within it would have eight um, reports. So if we go back to maps, another cool thing um, that happens within reports is you can also select a specific data point. So if I get rid of this percent households with no internet access and just look at libraries, if I click on one of these libraries, so say I'm curious about how many people are in the region um, maybe served by this public library. So they have a thing called radius report, which is pretty cool. And you can also get to it from this reports tab. Um, so say I wanna do one mile radius from that specific library. It'll search it, it'll kind of give me an idea for what's around it. So we're not quite in UNCG territory. Um, it's just within this public library and kind of downtown-ish um, Greensboro. So it'll tell us all the information that we would get from the previous report for like, you know, zip code or county, except it also gives us library system information. So it'll tell us um, how many registered users are in that area and then a, a percentage of users or a, a number of users as a percentage of that entire service area. So in that in that mile radius around that public library, 65% of folks are registered users or borrowers um, using that library. Um, they make 2 million annual library visits. Um, there's around seven average visits per person. Um, and I think that's per year. And then it also has public computers with internet. So there are 293 public computers with internet at this um, library or in this library system, in the Greensboro library system, sorry. And there are 1,350 uses per computer. Um, the ratio of population to public computers, there's a lot more people than public computers. Um, and only 10% or there are 0.10 computer uses per visit. So it's interesting to see that for an area like Greensboro that has so many people and a, such a large population density compared to a place like Jamestown, it's got eight public libraries within that area, but within this one library, um, there are so many uses of that computer um, versus people that don't have internet access at home. So if you're looking at things like, you know, should there be another library added to this region? one of these libraries is gonna be shut down or lose its funding. Um, things like, 
should the public library have uh, publicly available internet access or computers for folks to use, um, this would be an interesting, uh, good tool to use to kind of explore that um, information. So in this, all of this information can also be downloaded um, for a variety of ways. So you can save a report, which I think it saves as a PDF. Um, you can save it within the policy map, I guess, thing proper. So this is where it comes in handy to make an account. You can save things long-term. Um, you could print them into a PDF um, and you can also view other saved work. For maps, you can download the data specifically. So if I'm looking at libraries, it'll give you the option to download you know, which data are available um, that you have selected on your map. It'll ask you if you want to do a specific region, um, which I do want to do. These data sets are huge. Um, I don't want to do the entire IMLS data set for the entire United States because that's going to be a huge file. I'm not going to be able to download that. Um, so I just want to look at Greensboro. I think this is Greensboro City. There's this annoying pop up that's in the way. And then confirm your download. So it'll download in the CSV form, which then you could upload into your own GIS program or into another um, statistical uh, software or just Excel to explore it. Um, for tables, you can download the same. And I think it also downloads as a CSV. Or you could export, um, if I had something available, you can export it as an image. Um, let me add. Internet access. Nope, not available. Some data sets are available to share and some data sets aren't. Um, so you could also print this into a PDF if that is something that you would prefer. I guess there's an image. Um, the data, I think, will always be in CSV format. Yeah, CSV format is going to be how you get that data. Um, when you upload your data, um, it's from a CSV as well, so you can compare your own data. But that is all the examples that I have. If anyone has questions, you can email me at ejklein at uncg.edu. Um, but the best way to learn policy map is just crack it open and start clicking on things. Um, one of my favorite things to do is just spend, you know, 15 minutes every year now um, just selecting a data set and playing around with what data is available. Um, so thank you. And this is the end of the presentation. Great. So we did have someone enter the room um, and I uh, chatted them and asked if they have any questions. So while they're thinking about it, uh, I will just verbally say there um, the next one coming up is um, in October. Oh, sorry. I'm pulling it up now. Series on research and application. The next one is Tuesday, October 22nd at 12 p.m. Uh, by Leah Leninger, our health sciences librarian on journals, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and then we have another one coming up in November on Scopus by Megan Carlton, our science liaison librarian. Our next one for our other series on online learning and innovation is Tuesday, October 8th at 1 p.m. on Web Accessibility Resources at UNCG by uh, Melanie Ely, Ely, our UNCG Online Web Accessibility Coordinator. So um, I don't see any questions uh, from our participant. So uh, we will end this session. And thanks for coming. And thank you, Joe, for hosting. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm. Bye.